Hello everybody, my name is Grace and today I'm going to read the last three chapters of the book Who Was Steve Jobs? Chapter 6, Return to Apple Steve didn't know it, but he was about to be rescued by a cowboy and a spaceman. Inspired by Tin Toy, Pixar's first full-length movie opened in 1995. It was called Toy Story. All the characters were all toys. A cowboy doll and an astronaut action figure were the stars. Toy Story became the most popular movie of all the year. Pixar went onto it and made a dozen hits movies in a row. By 1996, after 10 years of struggle, Steve Jobs was a success. A big success. He wasn't a millionaire in, anymore, he was a billionaire. Apple, however, the company had co-founded, was struggling. Apple computers had failed to change with the times. Other computers were just as good and less expensive. Apple computers were slow. They couldn't handle new features that had been developed for computers over the decade. John Grusley, who had forced Steve out, had been himself forced out in 1993. Now the board at Apple wanted Steve back. For Steve, having the power to do things the way he wanted was more important than having a huge amount of money. He wasn't that interested in buying expensive things. The house where he lived with his family didn't look like the house of a billionaire. Steve had mixed feelings about returning to Apple. He had bad memories about the way he had been treated at Apple. He was already the head of a very successful company at Pixar. He and Loren had a daughter, had a daughter, Erin Senior, born in 1995. Did he really want to take on a struggling company? If it had been any other company, the answer might have been no. But Apple was his baby. He couldn't just sit and watch it die. Steve agreed to act as the head of Apple, but only for a while. Apple had to look for someone else to become his permanent replacement. He gave him a salary of $1 a year. Right away, Steve made big changes. In Boston in 1997, he announced to an audience full of Mac lovers that Apple was going to team up with Microsoft. Apple and Microsoft were going to work together. This was unheard of. But Steve said that Apple computers would use Microsoft's Internet Explorer web browser. Behind Steve on stage was a giant TV screen when Bill Gates, the head of Microsoft, appeared on the screen. The audience booed, but Steve knew that $150 million deal would help Apple. And he was right. The company's value rose. Steve made other changes. He got rid of products that weren't selling. He cut costs. He laid off so many workers that Apple employees were afraid of running an elevator with him. They were scared that they would no longer have a job by the time they get, got to their floor. Steve still claimed that he was only a temporary CEO. In 1997, he told Time Magazine, I'm here almost every day, but just for the next few months. I'm really clear on it but he was making changes for the future. Chapter 7. Think different. In 1997, in cities across America, a series of posters appeared on buildings, buses, and billboards. The posters showed photos of famous people for doing something new. There were posters of Alfred Hitchcock, the famous movie director. Another poster of Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz, the stars of One Love Susie. Another poster showed Jim Henson and Kermit the Frog. In the corner of each poster, there were two, 
There were Apple logos and two words, think different. And the ad campaign was the brand chart of Steve Jobs. He wanted to show that Apple stood for new ideas, not the same old, same old. The poster didn't advertise any particular product, but they told the public to be ready because something exciting was happening at Apple. What was, what was the iMac short for? Internet Macintosh. This new personal computer was inexpensive and easy to use. In the 1990s, there was a new, brand new pastime surfing the web. Steve wanted people to surf on iMacs. He also wanted iMacs to look different. The iMac came in a plastic case in five bright colors, inspired by Steve's visits to a jelly bean factory. Blueberry, grape, lime, strawberry, and tangerine. Within a year, Dimac became the best selling computer in the world. That same year, Steve and Lawrence had another baby daughter, Eve. Steve's eldest daughter, Lisa, was studying journalism at Harvard New University. It was a happy time in Steve's life. Steve had planned to only stay at Apple for a few months, but in, ten, in 2000, he became the permanent lead head. He had too many big plans to leave Apple now. In May 2001, Apple opened its first stores. Just as Apple computers didn't look like other computers, Apple stores were very different too. Made with a lot of glass, they looked more like works of art. Steve oversaw every step of the design of the stores from every f the floor titles to the shelves. Every single detail was important to him. At the store's genius bar, people could ask questions about problems with their machines and getting personal training on their computers. Steve had to put Apple on top of the personal computer market. As he had predicted, People used the computers for work and also for pleasure. Listening to music was something else people did for fun. In 1990s, people, most people listened to music on compact discs. A CD was like a record album. People bought CDs by their favorite groups and played them on CD players. They were about the size of a butter plate and had better sound than a vinyl record album. But Steve started thinking about something even better. He bought a software program that allowed people to take their favorite songs from a CD and put them on a computer as a digital file. It was called an MP3 file. Once it was on the computer, you didn't need the CD anymore. Steve renamed the program iTunes. Using iTunes, a person could turn their computer into a personal jukebox. Other companies created MP3 players. These were portable machines that hooked up to speakers or headphones and played music files. No CD or cassette tape was needed. Steve Jobs decided Apple to make its own player. In October, 2001, a press event in California. Steve reached into his pocket. He pulled out a thin gadget that was smaller than a bar of Hershey's chocolate. We call it the iPod, he said. First, the iPod only worked with the Mac computers. But in 2002, Steve agreed to make it work with Microsoft's Windows machines. Now Windows users could also use the iPod. It sells skyrocketed. Customers loved the iPod. People in the music industry did not. Most people got their songs played on their iPods of CDs. The CD didn't have to be theirs. For instance, they could get songs from for free from a friend's CDs. Songs could be also be shared over the internet. Nobody in the music industry could figure out how to make people pay for music that they could get free illegally. Nobody except Steve. Except Steve. If people could buy music easily and cheaply, they thought they wouldn't mind paying. 
because he could think different. Steve opened the iTunes Music Store in 2003. It was not a regular store. It wasn't in a building. It was a program you download onto a computer. Using his famous powers of persuasion, he made a deal with many record fam companies to sell the songs on iTunes for 99 cents a piece. In the first day it was open, iTunes store sold 225,000 songs. It was so easy to order songs, it didn't cost much. Everyone began buying music over the internet. Chapter 8, Insanely Great Apple was back on top and so was Steve. He was still the head of Pixar. He was also helping to raise Reed, Erin, and Eve. Lisa had graduated from Harvard. His wife, Lawrence, had founded College Track, a charity that helps kids from four families get into college. Steve had many plans for the future. Then something happened that he could not control. In 2003, a medical checkup revealed that he had cancers in his pancreas. Doctors as well as Lauren and many friends advised Steve to have surgery right away. But as always, Steve wanted to think different. Steve tried to treat his cancer by changing his diet, but the cancer grew. So in July 04, in July 2004, he agreed to have surgery to remove the tumor. He told people at Apple he expected to return to work in September. Steve did return to work. However, he didn't look well. He was losing weight and was pale. People worried that the cancer was growing again. He didn't talk much about being sick. But in 2005, he gave a speech to the graduating class at Stanford University. He said that having cancer showed him that time is limited. So don't waste it living someone else's life. Have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. By the words that Steve Jobs truly lived by, perhaps he didn't much have much time left. So once again, Steve began thinking about how to change the way people use technology. By 2005, cell phones were everywhere. Steve had a cell phone but he didn't like it. It didn't work well or look good. None of his friends seemed to like their cell phones either. Steve decided to make a phone that people could fall in love with. In 2007, at a show for new Apple products, Steve showed the audience the iPhone. The iPhone was much more than a cell phone. It was a powerful personal computer that can fit in your pocket iPhone made every other phone look outdated. It had a touch screen instead of buttons. Email was on it. The internet was too. The iPhone could take photos and film action. Even through early iPhones, like early Macs, had flaws. People couldn't wait to get their hands on one. Steve loved running Apple. But, but the beginning of 2009, he started taking time off. Steve didn't admit that his cancer had returned. Even so, everyone at Apple knew that the reason for his absence. Steve also got in touch with Walter Isaacson, a writer. Isaacson wrote <coughs> biographies. Steve asked if Isaacson could write his biography. Steve was usually very private, yet he was offering a tell all about his personal life. It seemed like he knew he might not live much longer. In April of that year, he had a liver transplant. Half asleep before his operation, Steve complained that the medical equipment was ugly and poor designed. A few months later, he returned to work. Despite his health, he had a new surprise for the public. In 2010, Steve bought bought out the iPad, Apple's new tablet computer. It was smaller, thinner, and lighter than anything before it. Tablet computers have been around for 20 years. 
But once again, Steve made it new and different. The iPad was was a portable computer with no wires. It was much larger, larger than the iPhone, so it was easy to read books on it, or browse the web, or watch movies, or play games. Apple sold three hundred thousand iPads in one day. In nineteen ninety seven. Apple had nearly gone bankrupt. In August twenty eleven, it became the most successful company company in the world. At that same month, Steve stepped down as CEO. He was no longer well enough to continue working. He stayed at home with Lawrence and their children. Many of Steve's friends came to spend time with him, including Bill Gates. The two men talked about old times. Steve said to thank. Steve said he thanked Lawrence for giving him semi sing. Bill said his wife Melinda had done the same thing for him. According to Steve, Steve's sister, Mona Simpson, a few hours before he died, Steve looked at his sister Patty, then his children, and then Lawrence. He said, "Oh well, oh well, oh well." Those were the last words. He spoke. It was October fifth, twenty eleven. All over the world, people mourned the news. Apple stores were covered in sticky notes thanking Steve for all he's done. People left by little apples on the ground in tribute. In California, young people placed candles in the shapes of Apple lo- logos on the sidewalk. Everyone felt that Steve Jobs had changed the way they lived. He hadn't invented the computer or the mouse or the MP3 player, but he took those things and made them part of everyone's daily life. He had done exactly what he set out to do. He achieved his dreams. One of the first people to speak about his death was his old friend and competitor, Bill Gates. He said. For those of us lucky enough to get to work with him, it's been an insanely great honor. So that's all of the book. Who was Steve Jobs? And also, we have finished the one hundred days challenge, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.